Hello and welcome to section 2 of chapter 32, the politics of boom and bust from 20 to 32 in the American pageant for U.S. history. Today we're looking at the uh, three-way race, three-way race for the White House in 1924 through the Great Crash. So Coolidge, who took over for Harding in 1923 because of uh, his death, uh, ran for his own nomination in 1924 for the Republicans. The Democratic Party was split between the wets and the dries, those who liked alcohol and those who liked prohibition. Farmers and urbanites, you know, rural versus urban. Fundamentalists, old school traditionalists versus modernists or modernists. Uh, John W. Davis wins the nomination, but that doesn't satisfy a lot of the uh, progressive wing of the Democrats. And so Robert La Follette, fighting bad, uh, ran for the progressives uh, as well, which splits the Democrats in two. Um, he had the support of the labor unions and the socialists. Uh, Coolidge won pretty easily as Americans one of the good times to continue. The economy was strong, and usually that's the number one indicator if the party or the president wins re-election or the party retains the power, is if the economy is strong, usually they, they keep it. Uh, if the economy is bad, usually there's change. Uh, so here's a campaign poster from the, from the uh, election. Keep cool with Coolidge for president. He's cool. He's the coolest. Uh, here's the electoral map. You can see it's pretty regional. The north and the west went to Coolidge. Uh, all the south went to Davis. And then Robert LaFollette won his home state of Wisconsin. So isolationism continues under Coolidge in his second term. It continues the policy of let's not get involved, except in the Caribbean. Now, Western Hemisphere, West Side homies for life, uh, they're not going to allow them to, you know, to do bad things. And so troops were sent to Haiti, sent to Nicaragua. Uh, Coolidge resolved the Mexican oil crisis in 1926 uh, diplomatically, so that that's good. Not threatening troops, but you know America is still meddling in the business of the uh, Western Hemisphere. Uh, after World War One, America became the creditor to the world, loaning money to various various countries. Uh, in 1914, to the dawn of World War One, the United States owed four billion dollars to the world in terms of, of loans. By 1922, the United States was a 16 billion dollar creditor meaning they had lent $16 million worth of loans out. Uh, the U.S. demanded to be repaid. That $10 billion loan that they gave to the Allies in World War I, they wanted that money, and they want it now because America likes money. Uh, the Allies, the French and the British, tried to say, can, we, can you, can you, uh, can you do us a favor here, do us a solid? I mean, can you maybe forget about that loan? You know, we did lose a lot more people. Our, the blood of our men should pay that debt. America's a little cold-hearted about it and said, no, you owe cash. Pay pay money now, which causes problems. So they demand repayment from France and Britain. They don't have any money, so they're going to go rob Germany for it. Uh, Germany is supposed to pay $32 billion in war reparations. Uh, and so basically France is you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul, to use the old cliche, the old analogy. Uh, French troops actually actually uh, occupy the Ruhr Valley in 1923 because of late payments. They, they occupy uh, German territory as collateral. Uh, Berlin began to just allow their currency to inflate. Let's just print money. Just print it and print it and print it. And there you go. Problem solved. You can have all the money. You can take our gold, but we have our own cash. <laughs> that doesn't work. That's why our money is worth something. Monopoly money is paper. It causes hyperinflation, where one U.S. dollar would buy would get you four trillion marks. Basically, it becomes so worthless that this woman here is burning German money because it's worth more as a fuel, uh, which causes their economy to collapse. You can't buy food. Uh, the Dawes Plan of twenty four rescheduled Germany's repayments that allowed the American loans to Germany. Germany gets rid of their money. They come back with a new type of money. It's just a giant mess, basically because America wanted this loans repaid. So you get this vicious triangle of lending. America owed more, owned more gold than the rest of the world combined, um, and so they're trying to like basically everyone's paying each other back. And if America would have just been a little more sympathetic. Maybe it doesn't cause the rise of Hitler and the Nazis and the fascists all over Europe. Hoover, when he was in power, tried a one-year debt moratorium in 1931. This is during the Great Depression. Everyone except Finland defaulted on their loans. They couldn't pay it back because the economy was so bad. And it creates a lot of ill will against America and Europe because we were kind of seen as this uh, very pushy banker that demanded their money. So here's the U.S. investors. They're investing in Wall Street. They have private loans to Germany. Germany's paying war reparations to Britain and France, which is their debt. 
Um, and then all that is you being used to pay back the United States Treasury for our war debts. It's just this vicious cycle going on. This is to show the German inflation under the Weimar Republic in the 20s when their currency really went bad. So in 1918, um, a loaf of bread cost 63 cents or Deutschmarks. Uh, by 1922, inflation had caused it to rise to 163 dollars or Deutschmark. So imagine going to McDonald's and getting your hot and spicy for a dollar and now suddenly three years later or four years later it's hundred and sixty four dollars. Hundred and sixty three dollars. You freak out. You lose your mind. By January nineteen twenty three it's two hundred and fifty Deutschmark marks. By July three thousand four hundred and sixty five by September one point five million. By November it took two hundred and one billion Deutschmarks to buy a loaf of bread. How do you how do you pay? Dump truck, wheelbarrow? I mean, what do you do with the change? It's just, it's absurd. Their economy collapsed. This gentleman right here is wallpapering his wall. Uh, well, obviously, I guess you would wallpaper a wall, not a ceiling. But he's wallpapering um, with money. These kids are playing, basically, before Lego stacks of bricks with money. That's money that they're stacking up in the shape of a pyramid. So, the election of 24. You have Herbert Hoover. Uh, regarded as probably the smartest man in America. I mean, he's been called a genius in the media. That's not a word thrown around lately, not usually associated with politicians, but he has been called a genius, a Stanford graduate, running against New Yorker Alfred Smith. Uh, Hoover promised to keep everything going. Hey, you like money? You like having a good time? We'll keep it going. We'll keep the same Republican policies. Smith was hurt because he was a Catholic. He also was a wet uh, candidate, meaning that he wanted to bring the liquor back. Uh, both candidates campaigned on the radio, something new, something, you know, novice and, and unique about the 20s. As you know, we have the advent of radio. Smith was unable to win the South, even though he's a Democrat, because he was a Catholic. Uh, his opposition to prohibition, his liberal ideas, and he had a really thick New York accent. I'll tell you what we're going to do, man. We're going to go bring the booze back. You know, we have a good time. Southerners didn't like that. <laughs> Southerners have their own way of talking. <coughs> Excuse me, that hurts my throat to talk like that. Hoover won the election of 28 in a landslide, becoming the first Republican candidate in 52 years to win a state that has seceded, except for Harding winning Tennessee. Uh, that closes the book on Coolidge. Joy. Uh, here's Hoover on a whistle-stop tour. Here's the electoral map. That's kind of dominance right there. I mean, uh, Alfred Smith only won Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Georgia and South Carolina. Do, do, do. Oh, forgot about Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Sorry. Pretty much a, a butt whooping there. So, Hoover's first, first moves. Um, disorganized wage earners and disorganized farmers were struggling, and he sought to help them out. He really had kind of the spirit of, you know, we can fix things. We can make the, the world a better place. He passes the Agricultural Marketing Act to set up a farm, federal farm board. They set up co-ops to buy surpluses to try to stabilize farm prices. So basically, if farmers had nowhere to sell their goods, the government would buy them and hold on to them. By doing that, they could pay, you know, farmers can make a livable wage is what they hoped. But too much surplus was produced. It sapped the budget. It kept prices too low. Uh, you also get, uh, in reaction to the stock market crashes, the Howley Smoot Tariff, which Technically, it was the correct thing to do economically in terms of theories. If the economy is bad, you need to raise tariffs, protect your own businesses. But what it does is it causes the basically the Great Depression to become a worldwide uh, depression. It's the highest protective tariff in the history of our nation during peacetime. Uh, the tariff deepened the depression that the United States had and other nations. So, yeah, bad move. So, let's talk about the stock market. Stock market doesn't necessarily cause the Great Depression. It's kind of interesting. It's a difficult thing to wrap your head around. Uh, it, it's, it takes several years for the Depression to hit. So you have the boom. During the 20s, you could buy stock on margin. You could buy stock with as little as 10% down. Uh, and if you bought stock for $100, let's say, and then it doubled, uh, you could pay $10 and get $100 worth of stock. And then if it sold uh, for double that, $200, you would make you know $100, $190 profit. Now, there's fees and things like that. So you can make a lot of profit uh, just from that initial investment of $10 down. So while the market goes up, you're doing well. So you want to buy low and sell high. Uh, now, people would borrow money from the banks to pay for the rest of the stock. So the banks, they were happy because they were getting their loan payment with interest. Uh, the stockbrokers are happy because they're getting their, you know, their, their fees. And then the stock investors are happy because they're buying stock and making money, basically doing nothing. 
And the companies are happy because they have more money to operate with. If stock goes up, profits are made, loans are repaid, everyone buys a new car, they go out and have a fabulous vacation, good times. What happens if the stock doesn't go up? Let's not talk about that. That's scary. Let's not talk about that. So, there's fears that the boom would end. Uh, brokers, the inside traders, start selling. They're kind of like, eh, this can't go on forever. We've had eight, nine years of really good stock market. So they start selling. And then the laws of supply and demand, when people sell, that means demand goes down, which lowers the price. When people see that their price has gone down in price, their stock has gone down in price, they might call their stock broker and go, yeah, we need to sell. So a couple more people sell and that lowers the price. And pretty soon people are starting to panic. Like, oh my gosh, the stock market's going down. I got to sell, 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 sell. And so it causes the prices to plummet. It creates a panic. People are on the phone desperately trying to sell their stock for whatever they can get. People are wanting to buy. They know that the stocks are plummeting in prices. They can hold out for a better deal. So you actually have not one, but two stock market crashes. October 24th, Black Thursday, 13 million shares were sold in one day. Uh, things open back up on Friday, pretty normal. Saturday, Sunday is closed. Monday is normal. Tuesday, Another panic. 16 million shares are sold. There's fist fights on the Wall Street stock with New York Stock Exchange. Uh, some guy lost a prosthetic leg. I'm not making this up. You can look it up. Uh, the market lost $40 billion in value. Oops. So what it means is those companies that normally had that cash, uh, that money to operate, they don't have that money anymore. And it takes a little while to catch up. And so to operate, they have, you know, maybe some coppers, they have some saved up money. But once that's gone, to operate under less uh, money, they have more, you know, their operating expenses are so high, they have to lay people off. And when you lay people off, a person loses their job, they don't buy as much food, they don't go to the movies as much, they might not buy that new car. So then the grocery store is not having as much business, so they have to lay off a worker. And then that worker is not being, you know, spending their money. They're not going to the movie. So the movie theater lays somebody off. And so then that guy didn't buy his new car. And the car dealership goes out of business. They lay off 10 employees. And suddenly it starts snowballing out of control. And everyone's losing their jobs. And that's ultimately what causes the Great Depression is the massive unemployment. The New York Stock Exchange closes for a few days after this. Here's a guy willing to sell his car. 100 bucks. He will buy this car. Must have cash. Lost all in the stock market. Can't pay back the loan. So here's the stock market. Yay, it's going up. Yay, got a bull market. Yay, peak tone. Nothing ever bad is going to happen. No. The election FDR slowly climbing. Yay, we get the Roosevelt recession. That's, you can see the, yeah, that's that good. This is called The Unemployed by John Langley Howard, painted in 1937. So what we have today, here's a kind of a grainy photo of this New York Stock Exchange afterwards uh, on Wall Street, kind of a panic. And we're going to stop there for now.